dove Scholars teach in universities and claim that they're smart and cunning Tell them find a cure when we sneeze and that's when their nose start running And the rich get stitched up when we get cut Wanna heal them broken bones in a bush with a wet mud Can you resize? Can you restart? Can you make peace? Can you fight war? Can you milk cows? Even though you drive cars? Uh, can you say Good afternoon, everyone. Good to Happy see you here. Um, I'm going to begin right away because we want to take all the time we have, which is two hours. Hi, Brandon. And we are, I'm now going to begin by introducing you to our guest speaker, Mr. Gerald Pereira. Gerald A. Pereira is a political writer, activist, educator, and theologian. His academic interests are modern political thought, Pan-Africanism, Caribbean theology, political theology, Black liberation theology, theology and culture, socialist theory and practice and global politics. He resided in Libya for four years and worked as a lecturer at the Green World Institute, the educational arm of the World Mataba. At the World Mataba, he encountered freedom fighters from all over the world and had the hour to work with the outstanding Pan-Africanist Kwame Touré, had the honor to work with the outstanding Pan-Africanist Kwame Touré, formerly Stokely Carmichael. Mr. Pereira has contributed articles to numerous publications, such as the Black Agenda Report, Final Call, Modern Ghana, Voice of Nigeria, Counterpunch, and San Francisco Bay Review. At present, he is the chairman of the organization for the victory of the people and an executive member of the Caribbean Pan-African Network. Gerald is the holder of multiple academic degrees in the area of politics, transpersonal psychology and theology, including double doctorates in theology. Welcome all, welcome Mr. Pereira. And I know he will want an interactive session, not the traditional lecture where you are sitting passively. Yeah. But he will deliver his presentation and then invite a conversation. And we have an eight year old in the room. I'm so happy to see him. Mm. <laughs> and I hope he pays good attention. So, Mr. Pereira, over to you. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Charlene. Uh, it was a four years, eight years in Libya. It doesn't matter. <laughs> That's a long thing. Anyhow, uh, this afternoon, 
allow me to indulge in a little digression here. I think students at the university owe it to themselves to develop a mind that could pursue what we call critical thinking and position yourself in such a way to smash false narratives as well as uh, false icons and images. We cannot just accept what has been told to us and keep regurgitating it. We have to question a lot of so established truths and see if those truths were actually relative or if they're absolute. And that is one of the uh, rules of those who are engaged in serious study at the university. And I wish that uh, those who of you who are involved in the social sciences and other areas will uh, pursue this path. Having said that, I am not trained in international law. I'm not a lawyer and I'm not into international law because what passes for international law, and I'm going to be very frank and honest with you all, is lawlessness. International law is a European construct and international law has always served and benefit the powerful primarily the colonizers. So we have to take that into account. I am going to tell you, I'm going to outline a number of things to you. And at the end, I want you to open your minds and see what is happening. Because one of the problems in this country, even with our constitution, we have lawyers reading the constitution and they're all getting it wrong. You know, people are getting it wrong and then it ha they constitute we, the arguments. These legal art cases have to go to the Caribbean Court of Justice. And one of the reasons for that is that constitutions, people, many people treat and see constitutions as merely like they're just merely legal documents. Constitutions are primarily philosophical documents. Of course, the legality is there and the legal aspect, what is called legal philosophy or the philosophy of law is part of philosophy and constitutions are shaped around that. But many of our lawyers uh, don't really have any philosophical training. I know there's a columnist who writes every day in the newspapers and uh, he always make reference to this lawyer, this or lawyer, that, that he taught at the university. He taught them philosophy. But I don't see that coming out. So I don't know how uh, rigid the philosophical training is. But I'm saying that at the end of the day, constitutions are primarily philosophical documents. Our lawyers are not grounded in, in, in philosophy proper. And therefore, we have all these... Uh, misreading of our constitution. So I am coming from the perspective of one who, having studied global politics, as well as the history of the colonizers. So I'm also bringing a philosophical ideological perspective because very often, whether we get comments from Mr. Carl Greenidge or Cedric Jews who are writing on this thing, we keep missing something. I can recall many years ago, the first time I went to Venezuela was in 1981 to, to a conference at the Central University of Caracas. I participated and there were two persons, two lecturers from the University of Guyana. One was uh, in the history department, the other one was sociology. Uh, one was Ken Dan's and uh, the other one, his wife became ambassador to Venezuela, Cheryl Miles, the late Dr. Uh, John Miles. And after the conference, we took time off to meet with representatives of various political parties. We met, met with parties on the left, socialists, communists, radicals. And we met with some parties from the right and the center right. 
like the two major parties, traditional parties, just like we have the PNCR in Guyana, the PPP. Venezuelan politics for years, decades, was dominated by the Democratic Action, a social democratic party, and what is called Copé or the Christian Democrats, a sort of a center-right party. And we spoke with Venezuelans from all, right across the political and ideological spectrum. And what we found was that all of them, whether they were in the right, the political right, the political left, or the center, they all believe that Esequibo belong to Venezuela. There was no, none of them differ. They all agreed on this because you have to remember that they were brought up on decades of this diet that Venezuela belongs, sorry, that uh, Esequibo belongs to Venezuela. Now, I've been doing, I've been doing a lot of research because I don't like what I'm seeing. And I know the Ministry of Foreign Affairs brought out a booklet uh, called the New Conquistadors. In other words, you know, the Spanish were the, con the, the, the conquerors or the conquistadors who came into the Americas. And so they're referring, the Guyana publication is referring to the Venezuelan government as the New Conquistadors. You know, the new, just like the old Spanish conquistadors. Now, I just want to say this. That when you listen, when you really get into this territorial controversy, I am more than convinced, and I called a particular lawyer, and I told him the more I get into this thing and read it, I'm absolutely convinced that both the British and the Americans, to use this word, conned us. We were conned. Having said that, at the same time, I do not believe that uh, the way that Esequibo belonging to Guyana today, it is out of the question that Esequibo can be handed over or handed back to Venezuela. Because I take the argument of those who argue that once a child is out of the womb, you cannot stuff it back in the womb. So handing Vene uh, Esequibo back to Venezuela is out of the question. But it is my opinion and the opinion of quite a few people who have done extensive research that maybe originally this land did belong to Venezuela and the British took it. But even if that is so, and I believe that is so, I do not believe that Venezuela has the right to get it back. And let me tell you why. We have to remember, I am, a, for example, I am an anti-colonialist. My ideology, I am opposed to colonialism and I oppose imperial domination. No one can argue, no one with a sane mind and a knowledge of their history and past can make any sort of apology or defense of colonialism and imperialism. Colonialism was a terrible Western European project. Colonialism came into the so-called New World and it wiped out millions of indigenous people 50 years after the arrival and so-called discovery of a white supremacist by the name of Christopher Colon, better known as Christ Christopher Columbus. So the Spanish came into this area and the Portuguese came. came. When the Portuguese and the Spanish started claiming a lot of lands, the two countries being Catholic, decided to take, they went to the uh, Pope and asked the Pope to divide the new found lands between them, which was done under the Treaty of Tordesillas. And the Pope divided the new found lands between Portugal and Spain, two Catholic countries. Of course, the other European countries didn't like that and did not recognize papal authority because 
they were Protestant. The Protestant Reformation had swept those countries, so they were very anti-Catholic. So they didn't recognize the Papal Treaty of Tordesillas because and France, countries like uh, uh, Holland, the Netherlands, in Britain, the Britain and others started venturing out as part of the And you're, you were coming in. Sorry? Sorry? Gerald, please yes, proceed. Please proceed. Yeah. Yes. So, as anti colonialists, as anti colonialists, we cannot defend borders. In principle, we cannot defend borders that were created by the colonialists. It is a contradiction. But at the latter part of the talk, I will tell you what is my opinion, what is my position, and the way forward. Because we have to realize that the carving up of what is known today as Venezuela and Guyana was done by Spanish colonialists in Venezuela and British colonialists in the then British Guyana. So we have to be consistent. We can't in one breath saying, we cannot be saying that we are anti-colonialists and in the same breath we want to defend the borders that the colonialists drew up after decimating indigenous populations. Okay? So what really took place was this, this territorial dispute, what was then called it dispute, or we call it territorial controversy, it officially began in 1841 when uh, Britain assumed control of the future of British Guyana, including Essequibo. They did this through a treaty with the Dutch called the Anglo-Dutch Treaty. And this treaty was done in the year 1814. Because as early as 1616, the Dutch had established the first European trading post near the mouth of the Essequibo River. And, and, and later on, uh, and settlements start following. You know, other people start to settle. But then Venezuela, Venezuela protested when after uh, Britain acquired Essequibo from the Dutch. Venezuela protested, started protesting, saying that the British were encroaching on Venezuelan territory. And the Venezuelan argument is, and it was, it is so shown, that the treaty between the British and the Dutch two colonizers did not define the western boundary that the British had commissioned it by Robert Schomburg because the British got Robert Schomburg who was a British citizen he was a surveyor and a naturalist and the British got him to delineate to, to draw the boundary right so by he carried out this survey in 1835 and it, he completed it, and it became known as the Schomburg Line. And the boundary effectively claimed 30,000 square miles for Guyana. Okay? So then in 1841, Venezuela disputed the British demarcation of the boundary. Venezuela had already obtained its independence from Spain because Simon Bolivar, the liberator, fought a war of liberation and the Spanish were defeated and the Spanish pulled out. So what was known as Gran Colombia, which was made up of what is now Venezuela and Colombia, right? Simon Bolivar's idea was to bring all together. But then later on, there were those who disagreed with Bolivar and wanted independent Colombia, but that is something different. But this whole area was called Grand Colombia. So Venezuela disputed it. And Venezuela claimed that the border was extended far east, too much to the east to the Esequibo River, thus taking in two thirds, that the British were able to take in two thirds for British Guyana. 
Then gold, gold was eventually discovered. Gold was discovered in the area. And the British sought to extend the reach by claiming 33,000 square miles west of the Schomburg line. Now, if you go, right? So, okay, just let me, I'll carry on and then I'll come back to that. So, the British extended the line after gold was found. And Venezuela protested this encroachment. Now, I want to stop here and tell you something. And I'll get back here. When you look at the British pattern, the British left Belize. The British Belize has a territorial issue with Guatemala. And that the Spanish was in Guatemala and the British were in Belize. So they still have that today. Good. Then you have the Malvinas, which the, the, are the people of Argentina refer to as the Falklands. You look at the map and you see where the Falklands is or the Malvinas, and it's near to, to Argentina. Thousands of miles away from the British, but yet the British claimed it and occupied it. Then you have in New Zealand, the indigenous people's land of Aotearoa before the Dutch, the, the British came in. And the British got the indigenous people, the Maori, to sign the Treaty of Waitangi. Up to today, every year when they celebrate the treaty, it is contentious. And there are many Iwi or tribes that protested because a number of tribes did not sign that Treaty of Waitangi. And the British deliberately mistranslated what the Maoris were telling them because the Maori concept of sovereignty was different to the white man's concept of sovereignty. And the British wrote that the Maoris ceded, ceded the territory sovereignty to them. The Maoris said never. I am just this divorced is just to show you that the British, the British have a history of deception and lying. And the Spanish and all of them are no different. But I'm showing you, I'm just showing you a pattern that should raise eyebrows and allow you, to give you the opportunity to go and do research and see what is happening. So Venezuela protested this in 1876. And Venezuela broke off diplomatic relations with Britain. Venezuela then appealed to the United States, asking the United States government to invoke the Monroe Doctrine on Britain. Now, I don't know how many of you know, but the Monroe Doctrine was named after US President James Monroe. And the Monroe Doctrine is a doctrine that no European power should interfere in the affairs of what America contemptuously referred to the small countries or the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean as their backyard. That's what they call us, their backyard. But despite that, right, when the Americans invoke, they've always invoked the Monroe Doctrine when it suits them. When Britain, when Britain under Margaret Thatcher sent warship armed, warships armed with troops to invade the Falklands to take it back from the Argentinians who had seized it, the Americans allowed the British to pursue it, to sail through, and to engage in a war with Argentina. They did not invoke the Monroe Doctrine. They invoked these, these principles and doctrines when it suited them. They invoked it when Russia, the then Soviet Union, Soviet Union was sending missiles to Cuba after the Cuban, just after Fidel Castro came to power and it sparked what is called the Cuban Missile Crisis. I'm showing you double standards and the hypocrisy of the Western nations. So much for the international law and doctrines. So 
the Venezuela, knowing that the Americans treat all of us and say, well, look, we're part of their backyard. Venezuela appealed to the United States and say, look, do something about this. Invoke the Monroe Doctrine against Britain. And they did invoke the Monroe Doctrine. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, why did America invoke the Monroe Doctrine on this territorial controversy in favor of Venezuela against Britain? Well, let me tell you this. If you go and you do the research, Venezuela, sorry, the United States has always been in Venezuela corner on this territorial controversy. controversy. So why is America suddenly in Guyana's corner? Why is Britain suddenly in Guyana's corner? We will come to that. But historically, the United States of America has always supported Venezuela's claim to Essequibo. But today you have the U.S. Secretary, the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, the black face, a black woman, a black face of white supremacy, coming into Guyana to tell us that they are in our corner. And nobody stopped to say, well, hello, 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 something isn't right here. And you as university students, the onus is on you to raise these issues and to think critically and not to regurgitate half-baked truths, false narratives that was thrust upon us. As young academics, this is what you have to do. So. America invoked the Monroe Doctrine on Britain. And Britain, America dispatched a letter to the then British Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary, Lord Salisbury, invoking the Monroe Doctrine in support of Venezuela and that Britain should have nothing to do with this issue. The British Foreign Secretary, Lord Salisbury, replied to the U.S. president because the U.S. told Britain that they must submit the boundary to dispute, to, to arbitration. Submit the boundary dispute to arbitration. And Lord Salisbury, the foreign secretary, responded to President Grover Cleveland, who was now the president because the Monroe Doctrine came in before President Cleveland. And the Monroe Doctrine over the years, at times it has been sleeping. And the last president who really kick-started again when he got into office was Donald Trump. Donald Trump. So Lord Salisbury replied to President Grover Cleveland, who was the then president, saying that Britain does not recognize the Monroe Doctrine that the Monroe Doctrine has no validity in international law. Well, the U.S. president was furious, and he responded. In December of 1895, he responded, say, asking the U.S. Congress for an authorization to uh, appoint a boundary commission, proposing that the commission findings be enforced by every means. Okay, there was even talk that there was going to be war between Britain and the United States over this territorial dispute. So when they say, well, look, that this thing, when the Americans say that this thing must go to arbitration to be decided, Venezuela was enthusiastic. Venezuela was happy. So Venezuela submitted everything. And then something strange happened. Venezuela said, oh, look how President Cleveland is acting. He's acting in our interests. We got this thing here. So Venezuela submitted everything. And then something happened. The thing, this issue went to sleep. It went to sleep. Britain, at the time, 
was fighting the the Brit that you had the British Empire was still strong. They had troops all over the area. They had too much on their hands to deal with, and Britain was fighting a war in South Africa with the Boers because the Boers were Dutch settlers who came in there. So the British had to fight with the Zulus and they had to fight the Boers who were settlers because Queen Victoria at the time lost a lot of her troops. Some of her best generals were killed uh, in South Africa. So Britain had too much on their hands and this whole thing went to sleep. The Venezuelans, we don't know if the Venezuelans heard anything or more but some backroom deal was done between the British and the Americans. Okay? Good. So fast forward. Fast forward. This thing went to sleep for decades. It went to sleep. This territorial controversy went to sleep for decades. Then something happened. Something happened. In 1961, Dr. Chedi Jagan became premier of the then British Guyana, 1961. And he lasted, he, he was premier from 61 to 64. This was long before when he, be, the, 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 uh, when he, uh, fifth, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. When he became premier. The Cuban revolution was in 59. The Cubans had the revolution in 59. And. Uh, uh, Chedi Jagan. Was an avowed. Chedi Jagan proclaimed himself. A. A. a communist. Marxist Leninist. Okay. So you had the Cuban Revolution in 59. And before the Cuban Revolution, Chedi Jagan was supposed to be the first self-proclaimed Marxist to be elected in the Western Hemisphere that came to power through the ballot long before Salvador Allende in Chile. So when this Chedi said that he was a Marxist, the Venezuelans got wink that Guyana was going to obtain independence in 1966. And the Venezuelans had a president by the name of Romulo Betancourt, who was a social democrat. And he was very anti-communist. And at the time, he was fighting a communist insurgency in his country. There was an armed communist insurrection to overthrow his government. And he said, he told President Kennedy that Venezuela will not abide by the, their, their arbitration that had supposedly settled this uh, arrangement and he saw it as null and void and he said that the communist guerrillas in Venezuela were being helped by Fidel Castro and that Guyana Guyana they were using Guyana and getting weapons from Guyana this is what he said so they objected to the independence in 66 and the Geneva Agreement, the Geneva Accord that was signed in 66, 1966, was signed between Venezuela and uh, Britain. But Guyana had to be a party to it. And Guyana signed on to it because we were getting independence. Now, some commentators are arguing that they did approach Jagan to sign it and he refused. And some of the PPP supporters and supporters of Dr. Jagan argue that President Burnham erred in signing the Geneva Agreement in 66 Accord, saying that he was under pressure from the Americans. Now, I don't know the reason why Burnham signed or who didn't sign. 
But I do know that this territorial, this controversy has always been used by the Americans against any government that they do not like. Whether the government happens to be in Guyana or whether it happens to be in Venezuela. And this is important for you to note. When President Burnham allowed, President Burnham was a champion in the non-aligned movement. Guyana established diplomatic relations. We recognized the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Guyana broke ties with Israel. We supported the freedom fighters in the frontline states against South Africa and Portuguese colonialism. We supported the Sahari People's Democratic Republic in the struggle against Morocco in the Sahara in the Sahara in the uh, in in North Africa. We recognized the Sandinistas when they overthrew Soma, uh, Somoza de Bali during the Nicaraguan Revolution. We supported the Grenadian Revolution under Maurice Bishop and many other progressive stands Guyana took. So Guyana under President Burnham was allowing the Cuban aircraft, military aircraft, to refuel in, Ang in Guyana because they were taking Cuban troops to Angola to help the frontline states in the fight against apartheid and against Portuguese colonialism. When the United States got wink under Henry Kissinger, he was the foreign minister, foreign secretary, secretary of state, that Burnham was allowing the Cuban troops, Barbados had first allowed them, and then the Americans pressure Barbados and Prime Minister Errol Barrow back down. But Burnham stood his ground and allowed the Cuban troops to refuel here. Had it not been for the Cuban contribution in South Africa, Nelson Mandela would have been rotten in prison because Margaret Thatcher said he declared him a terrorist. Margaret Thatcher, who was a former British prime minister, said he's a terrorist and he should remain in prison where he, right, where he uh, rightly belong and he should uh, rot. That's what th Those were her words. So Burnham allowed the Cuban troops to pass through here, going on to Angola. And what did the United States do? The United States were pretending today and saying that they're back in Guyana on this territorial dispute, on this territorial controversy. America was pushing Venezuela to invade Guyana. I'm not talking ancient history here. This is a couple of days, not too long ago. America was pushing Venezuela to invade Guyana. And they sold Venezuela F-16 fighter planes. And this was when President Burnham launched the People's Militia with the slogan, every citizen a soldier. Now, why is the Americans today supporting Guyana? Because the Americans, there's a government in Venezuela that the Americans do not like. The government is an anti-imperialist government. It kicked out Exxon because Exxon was looting the oil and gas and refused to pay the fair share, just like what they're doing in Guyana today. So America is supporting not the Guyanese people. America is back in Guyana because Exxon is here looting the oil and gas. And Exxon is not an ordinary company or transnational corporation. Exxon is an arm of United States imperialism. You challenge Exxon and the U.S. will bring its wrath on you. And that is why none of the leaders of the major political parties, whether those who are in power now and the ones who are in opposition, dare say anything against Exxon. There are a bunch of cowards who are afraid of the imperialists and they're afraid of white supremacy. They go down beating up on each other, Indian and black and black and Indian, when that's not the fundamental problem. 
The fundamental problem and contradiction in this country is that we have to continue the struggle for national liberation, complete the national liberation struggle, achieve true independence, and to do that, we have to wage the consistent struggle against imperialism, U.S. imperialism. Even the teacher's strike cannot be separated because while the teachers are fighting for better wages, the U.S. is feeding the government of Guyana a diet of lies about Venezuela want to invade and convince the Guyana government to spend billions of dollars on aircraft, gunboats, and guns. We will spend billions to fuel the permanent war economy of the United States while we don't have money to pay the teachers. The struggle is interconnected and interrelated. So the position, what I'm showing you is this, and no one is telling you this, is that this territorial controversy has always been used by the imperialists, by the United States against a government they don't like. When it was Chedi Jagan was there, they get when Chedi Jagan was the premier, they got Betancourt to say that the award is the, the, the arbitration award that was that settled, allegedly settled the thing, was not a void. When Burnham, the pressured Burnham, maybe to sign the 66 agreement, but of course Burnham went fully left and had took principal anti-imperialist positions, they reactivated it territorial controversy to use it against Burnham. Good? So now they have a government in Venezuela that they do not like. They're in Guyana corner because Guyana has a puppet government. Two puppet regimes. The previous one and this one. So now they're in Guyana's corner. And this position of the Americans is not based on principle. It's not based on principle. It is based on American geopolitics, America's interests, and only the interests of the United States and not for the people of Guyana. This issue, th this territorial controversy has rested for years and it's always activated when they want to use it against a government they don't like, as I said earlier, whether that government happens to be Guyana or Venezuela. And the only time this territorial controversy will go away is, I'm going to give you two examples to show you how it would go away. One, you would have to have two governments at the same time in Venezuela and Guyana that are anti-imperialists, that the Americans cannot bully. That's the only time it will go away. Or you have two governments, in Vene one in Venezuela and one in Guyana, that are clients of the United States. Now, this, I'm going to show you something that is quite interesting. President Maduro as you can recall, called a referendum in Venezuela. And Maduro called that referendum, his reason for calling that referendum was primarily to take what we call the wind out of the opposition sail. Because Maduro knew that whether you're anti-Maduro, whether you support the Venice Bolivarian Revolution or you oppose it, Maduro knows that all Venezuelans believe that Esequibo belonged to Guyana. So Maduro knows that he said, look, I'm going to call this referendum and you'll get an overwhelming yes. But something happened. The United States got a wink of maybe what Maduro was up to. So the United States told the Venezuelan opposition who they're supporting to tell their supporters to boycott the referendum. And they did. And when they boycotted the referendum, the turnout was not as huge 
was far away from what Maduro expected. So what Maduro said and did, about five days after the referendum, he said the Venezuelan intelligence services have information that the United States was passing money, huge sums of money, to, to the opposition to get the supporters not to go out. Because America knew that once everybody came out, the majority to vote on the referendum, then it would be what you call a feather in the cap of Maduro. So they told the opposition to stay away. Although the opposition, like all Venezuelans, believed that Esequibo belonged to them. Okay? So th that is the only time that will be solved. That territorial controversy will only go back to sleep if you have at the same time, two anti-imperialist governments in both countries, Venezuela and Guyana, or you have two governments, one in Guyana and one in Venezuela, that will go along with the U.S. So if the right wing, if the opposition gets rid of Maduro tomorrow at the Bolivarian Revolution, if the opposition takes power tomorrow in Venezuela, the border controversy will go back. To dormancy, it will go back to sleep. It has always been used by the US against a government that they don't like. I hope you see this. Now, uh, this thing about the international, the international court of justice. Guyana took this case to the International Court of Justice and the International Court of Justice, I don't know, first of all, a number of us are trying to uh, find out why Guyana went to the ICG. Were they pressured? Do they know something that we don't know? But uh, President Ali made a very interesting statement. And a, a Caribbean Pan-Africanist who is uh, also a lawyer, uh, a brother by the name, he's from St. Lucia by the name of uh, White, he called me. And he's very good. He's, he's trained in international law. And he said, Gerald, I was listening to your president and he made a statement which bowled me over. He said, President Ali said, whatever is the ruling of the ICJ, Guyana would abide by the decision. He said that was a strange statement. And indeed it is strange. He said it is, it, it is either two things. Either President Ali knows something that we don't know or He's lying. Well, Guyana went to the ICG and asked that they make a ruling on the referendum. And a number of Caribbean lawyers are arguing that Guyana made a terrible move, that the move they made towards the ICG was reckless because Guyana can still go back to the Geneva Arrangement Agreement of 1966 that shows that you can go to all the modalities. So if you come up with one and Guyana doesn't like it, Guyana could say, we don't want that. We moved to another one. So the ICJ thing is one of the modalities. But why did Guyana go to it? Because we know, for example, that when the Granger administration got the 18 million signing award, Nobody, they, they are, it was hidden from the people of Guyana until it was leaked. And then the, the finance minister, they, they told us that it was a, a signing bonus that they got from Exxon. And then somebody admitted that the money was being used for lawyers in the ICJ case. So I won't doubt that Exxon is behind it because Exxon is looking out for the interest. But the ICJ ruled, and this is listen to what the ICJ ruled. And a lawyer sent this to me. The ICJ made a decision. 
and the decision speaks about Guyana, quote unquote, administering and exercising control over the territory of Esequibo. You hear that? Exercising administrate admin ex, uh, Guyana, administering and exercising control over the territory of es, territory of Esequibo. It doesn't say anything about ownership. Ownership and control are two different things. I can be in control of a business, but I'm not the owner. Lee Ayokoko was the general manager of General Motors. He was in control of it, but he was not the owner. So Venezuela is telling, the Venezuelans are telling other diplomats and lawyers in the Caribbean that this shows Venezuela is interpreting it to mean that the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, has confirmed that Guyana does not own, notice, that Guyana does not own Esequibo and therefore does not have the right to give away territory, to give away license to Exxon, for example, for mining, for uh, exploration. There we go. So the ICJ, so President, these guys, we are dealing with a set of leaders. And I got to bring in my political line here because I'm a leader of a political organization. These two people, these two parties, they tell us about Republican status. And when the month of May come, we will hear a lot of talk about our independence and sovereignty and all that. It's on paper. It's on paper. It's only on paper. Our sovereignty has been trampled upon. Our independence is a facade. We are not an independent, truly independent state. It's neocolonialism. Our independence is not something substantial. Walter Rodney referred to this type of independence as briefcase independence. We call it flag and anthem independence. You have your own flag, you have your own anthem, your own pre president. But real power does not lie here. It lies outside. And it's called neocolonialism. You're seeing the day-to-day -day black and white faces, the black and Indian faces like yourself. But the white faces outside and some of their black faces, the black faces of white supremacy like the ambassador, they're pulling the strings. And if you as young students at the University of Guyana honestly believe that strategic decisions about Guyana is made in Guyana, you better wake up and smell the coffee. It doesn't happen here. Strategic decisions about this country is made outside of this country. And our leaders go along with it. And they're quite happy to go along with it because they don't want to carry out any meaningful transformation of this country, what we call the new plantation. They're happy to manage it. Even Pippin Tom wrote an article in the Kaicho News saying that, that the PPP is happy to play along with their masters. All of them play along with their masters. So this ICJ ruling, it is not nice. It is not nice. And what President Ali said, that statement is reckless. So I want to stop there because there's a lot more we can say. But I just, I'm going to stop there and allow you to uh, ask questions in your comments and so. Mr. Pereira, thank you very much for that extremely in-depth in and what should I say? Very dense presentation. Uh, students, we're recording. Students and other visitors to the lecture, we're recording it. Your questions will be recorded. We wouldn't be able to take everybody's question in the time, but I'm going to ask you, if you have burning questions, please put them in the chat. Not in the question and answer, because that isn't that doesn't get saved, but the chat gets saved. And he could attend to those questions at a different time. 
So I now would like to open the floor. The mics are, you can just unmute, raise your hand and unmute and speak. I did not close off the, um, the webinar so that you don't have access to the mic. So please feel free to comment, question. There is no stupid question. Hi, forgive me. I'm I'm not sure where to find my raised hand anymore. It seems to have moved. But I do have a question for Mr. Pereira. I re remember you discussing somewhere along the lines um, of the U.S. Uh, government's incline towards supporting the Venezuelan government in the entire border controversy. And then the question came to it came to mind of why exactly they switched from supporting the Venezuelan government to the Guyanese government. And you answered that. And I the reason um, I was wanting to answer the quest ask the question is that I thought it had something to do with the finding of oil and the explorations that Exxon has done and the, well, new boost in the oil industry. And I can understand where the um, U.S. government's incline would come towards supporting the Guyanese government. But what I wanted to know after you already answered the question was when exactly, if you do know, when exactly did the transition from supporting the Venezuelan government to the Guyanese government happen? Because as far as I remember, Exxon started explorations in 2008 and they didn't find oil until 2015. So I'm fairly certain that they must have, well, the US government must have switched support from uh, the Venezuelan government to the Guyanese government. Otherwise, there would still be some sort of controversy when the decision making is happening to allow um, Exxon the ability to continue um, searching. So if you could just share any of the dates or so or discuss more on that part, then I would really appreciate it. Okay. What what happened was um uh the late president Chavez, the late president Chavez, uh many years ago, he was in the military and he uh carried out, he attempted a coup, a military coup. Because uh, when I, the first time I went to Venezuela, I said in 1981 to that conference in central Caracas, as a Pan-Africanist, one of the, and, I, and someone, you know, I, one of the things that I observed on arriving at the airports, Simon Bolivar airport, is I noticed all the, uh, on board that uh, Venezuelan flight, I think they played Aeropostal. You got Venezuela, they got the two airlines, Aeropostal and some other one. But uh, on the board of Venezuelan airline, all the uh, stewardess and uh, the pilots, they were all uh, what you call uh, white Venezuelans. All the, the entire immigration staff, the counter staff at the uh, Cambio, everything, all the, the duty-free shops and everything were all... Uh, you know, uh, white Venezuelans. And the only time I saw African Venezuelans was when I went into the restroom. So that was very noticeable. As we were driving out to get into the city, I noticed along the highway on, on top of the mountains, they were huge. You have all these uh, slums, a lot of slums. And Venezuela had Venezuela been reaping oil for, for decades, but yet the oil wealth did not improve the lives of the masses of people. It was the elite, a powerful Castilian elite, descended descendants of the wealth, the Spanish bourgeois, the Spanish colonies, the, the white bourgeoisie that benefited. And you had large sections of the indigenous people and those who were Africans and those who were mixed with indigenous and Africans on the margins. President Chavez was a he had Spanish in him, but he also he was very proud and always spoke of his African ancestry and he spoke of Mother Africa and that they all Venezuelans have African in them. He, that is him, right? So he saw that this inequality in wealth and distribution, 
and Chavez carried out, a, attempted a military coup and it failed. And he was imprisoned. After serving a time, I think he was, uh, they, they released him because he was quite popular. And he established a political organization to contest the elections. And Chavez won the elections. He won, he defeated the two established parties and he initiated what is known as the Bolivarian Revolution. Okay, so he started to rein in the oil companies who were rooting it and not putting in what Venezuela was supposed to get. And Exxon was one who did not want to go along with the demands of the new government. So they were eventually kicked out of Venezuela. And it was when Exxon was kicked out of Venezuela that the U.S. started applying all the sanctions on Venezuela. Okay? They started applying the sanctions. But I was not in Guyana at the time when Chavez visited Guyana. But I read what he said when he got here. Ch uh, the PPP was in office. And he said that we should put, these were his words, he said that Guyana and Venezuela need to put this territorial controversy on the background. Forget about it. He said it was created by the, colon the colonizers and we need to put it aside and work together. Because he saw that. Okay? But well, Burnham, when he came here, Burnham had died. Uh, the PNCR was out of office. They lost the elections. Chedi Jacob became uh, president, the elections was in 92, he came in 92, 93. So when Chavez came here, Janet Jagan was when she was a uh, president, uh, when she was president, she took over from Chedi. She signed a number of oil blocks, blocks and handed it over to Exxon. She was only supposed to give a certain amount and she gave them more than what she was supposed to give it. And when the new government came in, uh, they, they went along with it. And uh, even when Granger was leaving office, you heard Raphael Trotman said he was told to sign. Granger told him to sign and handed over more. So we had two governments who were quite happy to give it away to, uh, to, to Exxon. So it is not, we know that oil was already discovered, as you said rightly, around at 80, uh, 82 or something like that, or whenever it was, or uh, not in 82. Uh, what was the year you mentioned? Sorry? They started explorations in 2008, but they didn't find oil until 2015. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, years ago, you know, before that, years ago, uh, there was a company called Home Oil. They found the oil in the Northwest, some in the Latham area. And President Burnham asked a substantial amount and thing, and they, they refused. And they, he said to shut it down. And that was it. So when Exxon... When Exxon uh, got in here, we had already initiated since the time of President Hoyt a program called Structural Adjustment, right? The Structural Adjustment, after President Burnham died, the IMF and World Bank came in and imposed uh, what is called the Economic Recovery Program on Guyana. And we signed on to a thing called the Washington Consensus, meaning uh, that we will follow neoliberal economics uh, privatize strategic assets, give it away, sell it out and all of that. And from every president, from President Burnham, sorry, from President Hoyt, right down, every president has pursued that. That was imposed on us. I know from the records that uh, uh, Chedi Jagger was not happy to go along with it because he felt that if you privatize, only a certain section of people will have the money uh, to buy the state assets. And he, he didn't want it. He tried to delay it, but there were people who were pushing it. And you, you, there's no person, body who pushed privatization more than, than uh, President Jack Dio. He's a champion of neoliberal economics. And uh, President Ali is doing the same. All over the world where that policy, that economic model has been implemented, the gap between the have and the have nots has been increasing, are increasing. So Venezuela, uh, America switched sides. Venice, America switched side to support <laughs> Guyana because they now had a regime in Guyana that was happy to go along with the Americans. Right? It was easy to pound. The Americans, the Americans. I will put it in simple language for you. 
The Americans are bullies. Once you stand your ground and assert your right to your national self-determination and sovereignty, the Americans will put pressure on you, like they're doing Cuba. The pressure that America puts on Cuba has nothing to do with because Cuba is communist. Vietnam is communist and China is communist and America does big business with them. So that's out of the question. The problem with America has with Cuba is because Cuba has asserted its sovereignty and independence. That's it. Same thing goes to Nicaragua. Once you assert your right to self-determination and you will not be dictated to, you become an enemy of America. It has nothing to do with ideology, whether you're communist or what. No, no, no. Simple as that. So that's, that's the American position. And that's why the Americans, even France, that was defeated on the battlefield by, by the Haitian Liberation Forces and the people like Dessalines and Toussaint, turned wrong and had to recognize Haitian independence. And the United States refused. These were The United States was 13 colonies at the time. And the U.S., who fought for the, the war of independence against the British, turned wrong and opposed Haitian independence. You know what they said, the founding fathers? We can't allow a bunch of niggas down in a the backyard there who just kill white people and take independence to recognize them. If we recognize them, what's going to happen here in the States? Because all of the founding fathers, all those American, the founding fathers, George Washington, the first president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, John Jay, the chief justice, Benjamin Franklin, all of them, when they signed that declaration saying that we are born and granted in illegal rights, granted us by the creator, had slaveholders. They were, they had slaves. Everyone was a slaveholder. So when they were speaking about men having inalienable rights that are given to them by the creator, they were speaking about red men and black men. They were speaking about white men. Men were synonymous with white. They were speaking about the blacks, the enslaved Africans. We need to understand this. We need to understand this. That all the founding fathers, this is not Pereira's position. This is not an opinion. Opinion is subjective. This is historical fact. This is objective. All the founding fathers, as common knowledge, were slaveholders. So they did not want to recognize Haitian independence because it was setting a bad precedent. So they've always, it was only years after they, they recognized Haitian independence. And when they did so, it was a neo-colonial arrangement where they installed a man named Papa Doc and they controlled the country. And then you had a president by the name of Jean Bertram Aristide who was popular, who was preaching. He came from a background of liberation theology, which was all about contextualizing the gospel, the option of the gospel for the poor, the downtrodden and the oppressed. And he won an election, his Lavalas, the cleansing flood. Won an election. And what happened? Right? Haiti was paying the French. They, they enslaved the Africans. And instead of they paying Haiti reparations, Haiti had to turn back and pay them for enslaving them because Haiti took control. And up to today, Haiti was still paying. And Bertram Harris, they said, we're not paying. We're not going to pay. And the United States invaded U.S., Britain, and Canada. Pull Aristide out of his bed at night at gunpoint, put him on a plane and sent him into exile in South Africa under the Clinton administration. That's what you were dealing with, a bully. So none of these, if you, if God spare your life, all of you, and you're in Guyana until 80, once these two major political formations are around, Holding to the same position, we will continue to be a client state. And Exxon, listen to Exxon. I don't know if you all are following the papers. Exxon and Chevron are having a big war over Guyana. What the, excuse me, what the hell is happening? These two huge companies, are, corporate multinationals, are fighting over Guyana. Two corporate predators. And nobody's stepping in to say, hold it, hold it, hold it. Do you know this is a sovereign and independent state? It's unbelievable. So that is what we're facing. So America's not here. America's not here really to pr pr protect 
Africans and Indians and Amerindians are gay, and they're here to protect Exxon and the wealth. That is what they're here for. That is what they're here for. It's simple as that. Students, you can read. Students, you can speak in the chat. I see Stefan's question, but Stefan can unmute and ask it. And just before oh, any- Stefan is saying I, it. I just want to say said, quickly. Sure. I do not, I'm, I'm going to be, I, I believe that, I believe intellectuals, academics, intellectuals, especially progressives must be radically honest. I, I, I am a, I, as a revolutionary and a socialist, I support the Bolivarian revolution. Pan-Africanists all over the world, you'd be surprised. Pan-Africanists in, 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 uh, in, in Nigeria, Ghana, all over the world are supporting the Venezuelan revolution. It has nothing to do with Venezuela and Guyana territorial uh, controversy. But they're supporting Venezuela against United States imperialism and bullyism. That is what they're supporting. Good. I am not particularly a fan of President Maduro. Maduro is one individual. I think sometimes the way he speaks plays into the hands of the bullies. Right? I think even the Venezuelan Communist Party, which is anti-imperialist, had some criticism of him. But... I am not going to con I am not going to put Ma co uh, confused with Maduro with a mass with a thing called a revolutionary process known as the Bolivarian Revolution. I think sometimes the statements he make plays into the hands of those who want to push. And I, what is going on is the Americans are feeding the Guyana government a lot of lies. Good because America wants to set Guyana on a course with Venezuela so we can have a war. And when we have this war, America will be involved and America will eventually be able to take control of both countries permanently. That's why they're pushing for a military base. Do not believe these liars when they say they don't want to set up a base. They're liars. They've set up bases in, in, in Iraq and the Iraqi parliament on three occasions asked them to leave and they refuse to leave. So the Iraqi militias are firing missiles and drone at them and fighting them. It's like you invite me to your home for a meal and I come and I misbehave and you say, Pereira, leave your home. And I say, no, I'm not leaving. Right? That is what is going on. Good. Venezuela has suffered years of sanctions that has damaged the economy. Why would Maduro, whose economy is damaged and is struggling now, he's going through some recovery, would want to risk an invasion of Guyana? That's like giving the U.S., the U.S. has sanctioned you for years to bring you down. Sanctioned you so it would hurt the economy and make your people leave the country as refugees. Why would you want a war? It doesn't make sense. It's just irrational and illogical. Because even if he was to launch a military attack on Venezuela, it's a he has to pass through Brazil to launch thousands of troops. And Brazil would not allow that. And the United States won't want anything better than that to finish him off militarily, they will achieve that militarily and uh, with what uh, sanctions would not uh, was not able to achieve. So Maduro will have to be an absolute lunatic and I don't think he's a lunatic. Stefan Farrier is asking, what would be yeah. your recommendation to the Guyanese government? What would you say is the correct position to take? Good question. I think at the end of the day, we are neighbors and we have to talk. Maduro invited the Guyana government to talk. I think, Charlene, you could, uh, you were there. Uh, you, you can recall that uh, we attended a Zoom meeting that I had some technical problems with at the time. Yes. And we had two powerful players from Venezuela were doing presentations on the territorial controversy. I sent that Zoom link to a number of Guyanese diplomats and politicians, including Carl Greenwich. And not one of them showed up at the Zoom. Only two Guyanese 
showed up. Am I right, Charlene? Correct. Didn't you find it strange that if we have a discussion like that, that you would want to hear what the Venezuelans are saying? Yes, I I, I thought it was an act of cowardice because um, yes, I sent it to a number of them. Gone. I sent it. I sent it yes. to them to Carl Greenwich and many others, and I was mm -hmm. shocked that they did not show up. That they did not show up. All they sent back to me on the text was "thank you." That was all. I was shocked. Anyhow, uh, the question is, we have to talk, and this is what Ralph Gonzalez did. Ralph Gonzalez from Saint Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, who is a very brilliant, a very brilliant mind. Ralph for years was a, a lecturer in political science at the university. Ralph did. Uh, Ralph PhD is in uh, political science, and then he went back to university to do an LLB in law. So he's both a political scientist and a lawyer. And Ralph has written, of course, he, he, a number of books. And Ralph got together with the Prime Minister of uh, Dominica, Prime Minister Skerritt and others, for a conversation between Presidents Ali and Maduro at Argyle in St. Vincent. And I was told, I was told by top diplomats who are not Guyanese, who were there, that the U.S. was putting pressure on the governments of St. Lucia, not St. Lucia, the government of uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Dominico not to hold this conference between President Ali and Maduro. So it shows you that somebody is preventing us from talking. Somebody wants an environment of hostility so that it can lead to war. So President Ali had to take out of the shame. He couldn't do anything else. He couldn't say, well, I can't come. So he went. And they, read, met, they arrived at certain agreements. They signed the Argyle Agreement. And they're supposed to have meet for in Brazil under Lula for further talks. President Ali had barely left St. Vincent. When the next thing you know, he didn't too long before he actually landed or the day, the day he landed, the next day, a British warship arrived in Guyana. You have to see that something is radically wrong there. Even Caribbean diplomats and activists are saying, what the hell is this? What message are you sending? You just left, signed an agreement that there will be no hostility and a British warship sailed in. Even if the British warship came for an ordinary exercise, and it has nothing to do with the territorial controversy. Perception becomes reality. So the Guyana government keeps blundering and blundering. So there is pressure being put on them. And the people who are applying the pressure want a war. So they have convinced Guyana that you need to buy weapons. You need to have armored cars. You need... Uh, patrol boats that could shoot missiles to ships, Hel Apache helicopters and all that. And that's going to cost us billions, not millions, billions of dollars. Because the U.S. economy is fueled by war. The U.S. has to be in permanent war. You look ever since the end of the so-called Second World War, which was primarily a European war. The U.S. has been involved in wars ever since the Second World War finished. They went to the Second World War. They went to the Korean War. They went to the Vietnam War. Look at it. They've been in wars of invasion. They invaded Nicaragua. They invaded Grenada. They invaded the destroyed into Afghanistan. They invaded uh, uh, Panama. Bombed the hell of it. Most of the people who died were Africans. They, they bombed. Uh, uh, they destroyed Iraq. They destroyed Libya. They went into Somalia because they want to maintain their hegemony. The domination and they're being challenged at the global level because the world is moving towards a multipolar world. 
The world is moving towards a multipolar war. And there's nothing more vicious than a dying Thai lion that will lash out in any direction. And we're witnessing yeah. it. So they're going to put tremendous pressure on the government. But at the end of the day, it is the masses that make history and the people will have to be the decisive factor. So that question yeah. again that the young brother raised, yes, they have to talk. And we have to talk without any bully standing in the background and telling us what we must do and when we should not talk. Well, the same because young man is not going to go away. And I, I did mention to you earlier, sorry, my train the thought there. When I said I went to Venezuela and I saw Africans in the uh, cleaning the toilets and so. And why I mentioned that is because the Bolivarian Revolution under Chavez brought Africans from the margins to the center. If you go, the last time I passed through Venezuela, from New Zealand coming to Guyana, when I hit the airport, all the entire, this is important for you to know, the entire immigration staff, all the people at the Cambios and everything, you'll see the odd white one, African Venezuelans. And the way they treat you, it's amazing. Very facilitating and so the commander, the commander of the Venezuelan ground forces is an African Venezuelan. And many of you will not be aware of this. Venezuela under the Bolivarian Revolution, under Maduro's government and Chavez government, appointed two women, two black women as, um, as Venezuela's ambassadors to again. I had the the, the uh, opportunity to meet one, Dr. Martinez. Uh, she had a doc. Uh, she's the holder of a doctorate in international relations. She was the the first black person and woman to be a Venezuelan ambassador in this country. Now look at compare that with Brazil. Brazil has this largest concentration, second largest concentration of Africans after Nigeria. And for all the years that Brazil has rela diplomatic relations with Guyana, Brazil has never sent a black ambassador to this country. So I'm showing you something that is important for you to note. And that's why the Pan-Africanists are back in the Venezuelan revolution because Africans are very much involved. Africans are very much involved in it, just like you are seeing that now for the first time, there's an African woman who is the deputy, who is the vice president of Colombia. No right-wing government has ever brought black people to that thing. That's a social left-wing leaded government in Colombia. So those are gains for African people. And as an African, I am a Pan-Africanist who believe in the emancipation of African people all over. I am not going to point a gun and I had good military training, I'm not going to point a gun at any black person, any black person, to kill a black person on behalf of people, another set of people who will benefit. You know, we have these stickers. I like being radically honest. We have these stickers on the car saying, Guyana, uh, Esequibo belongs to Guyana. Yes, I agree. Esequibo belongs to Guyana. But the question is, the real question is, and Guyana belongs to who? Who? Theoretically, who? Theoretically, oh, you say, well, it belongs to all Guyanese. Well, you try getting a piece of land and then see how long it will take. See how long it will take. You waited 15 or 20 years for a piece of land and you have 14 families in this country. This is a well-kept secret. 14 families, powerful families in this country who give millions of dollars to both parties when it's election time, control thousands of acres of this land land thousands of acres of land in this country and it doesn't matter which party is in office they keep getting more because they give them millions during the campaign and you waiting for years to get a piece of land to put up a house so you know what i just tell them i say when the time comes to fight let the 14 families let them and their children go and fight they must go and fight I will fight and defend Guyana when the people of this country are politically and economically in power. When we democratize the economy so that the wealth of this nation could be used so that every person can have a decent standard of living. And with the wealth of this country, 
is not abused and misused and distributed for privileged few. When that happens, then I will lay down my life for the land. But I will not fight for the ruling classes, for the political elites, the political bourgeoisie, regardless of which party, major party they come from, and for the business class in this country. No way. Well, Stefan is reiterating your major themes. War is profitable, so they want us to destroy each other so they can take over. Correct. Well said. So, so you well recommend said, that there be, right. So you recommend, he continues, that there be talks without influence from these other influences. That's right. But there earlier, are... sorry. He, yeah. he earlier attempted to widen the discourse and the understanding of geopolitics. He said it sounds reminiscent of Putin's position with Ukraine before the war, an uninvited guest. Well, he was speaking about your um, earlier discourse. Maybe mm -hmm. Stefan could try to see if his mic is working. Oh, uh, sounds the thing about Putin's position with Ukraine. Yes. I, I like his train of thought, but if you could Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we're yeah. hearing you. And when Stefan is finished, I'll see you can speak. Go on, Stefan. Go ahead, brother. When I, when he had when he had made the comments about the British warship uh, entering Guyanese uh, maritime territory uh, after yeah. the talks held in St. Vincent, that is when I was saying it's an uninvited guest. And uh, after listening to uh, a, a portion of the interview that Tucker Carlson had with Vladimir Putin, uh, there was mention of talks between Russia and Ukraine, and uh, something seemed uh, like analogous to this situation with mm -hmm. uh, Guyana and Venezuela. And Good then point. I think what uh, Vladimir Putin had said is that when Ukraine had already signed something and they were going to reach an, an amicable solution, and then Boris Johnson, the then Prime Minister of, of Britain, encourage Ukraine that no, don't do this. It's better to go to war with Russia. I think that's what I heard from the interview. So, well, in other words, they would... They... Go on, go on. Finish, sorry. Yes. Go on. So in other words, at least my understanding so far, and I haven't digested all the content there is, so it's kind of limited, but it seems to be that there would be peace if not for other people who have nothing to do with the issue poking a stick at two dogs that are coming down. Okay, I. it shows that you are following things and you are absolutely correct. You're right. You've been following what has been going on and your interpretation is solid. That's true. Because they wanted war with Russia. They pushed, they're using Ukraine as a proxy, but that's another thing we can't, we don't want to take over time and that, but you're right. You're right. They want a war. The idea is to weaken Russia, encircle Russia, and then to move to, to push with Taiwan. They, they're hustling for war too with China. But a war with Russia, I see one of them, uh, Macron is saying that NATO troops should enter the war against uh, Russia. And other countries are saying, no, that's what Macron, Macron that was just kicked out of the Sahel countries in Africa. Good. Once a war, a war with Russia, NATO is to enter full war with Russia. It will be the end of humanity. It's going to be, it will be a nuclear war that will destroy the planet. These people are genocidal and we have to make sure we have to stop again. The West is genocidal. They want a nuclear war and you cannot defeat Russia. Russia, it, if you study the history of the Second World War, you will see that had it not been for Russia, Hitler would have conquered Europe. That's why Hitler had most of his military divisions in Russia. Because when Hitler was fighting, when uh, Russia was fighting Hitler, the American war machinery was back in Hitler. There's a very, there are a number of books on this. You can read uh, Hitler's friends in Washington. And there's a book by a Jewish guy uh, trading with the enemy. How the Rockefellers, the Fords, and all the DuPonts and all of them were trading and doing business and hoping that Hitler would win the war. And they only entered the war after Japan 
went into uh, Pearl Harbor. That's another thing. But you got to see these people over the decades, how for the centuries, how they have been operating. But you're right in, in, in what you just said. Asiya, your question or comment, please. Good evening, everyone. Um, sir, this isn't exactly, my question isn't exactly pertaining to the Guyana-Venezuela uh, dispute, but it's been a question that's bothered me for quite some time, and it's about communism and Marxism. So I've heard you say that um, the U.S., it, it really doesn't have to deal um, if a government is communist or not. Um, but they have, on many occasions, used that as a a sort of reason as to why they can intervene in the Caribbean and other um, surrounding uh, states. Um, my question is, why are they using that as a reason? I mean, I know that uh, you said that. Uh, sorry. Well, it's a it, 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 it's a bogeyman. You have to, you know, you there must be a reason when you're going to do something. You have to justify it. So you come up with something, right? You create a straw man, and you do that. Now, if you look, if you look at this, right? Uh, I'll show you. I'll show you something. For example, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Many moons. The, the Chinese. The founder of modern, the founder of modern China, Mao Zedong, led a war of liberation, and he established it when they established the People's Republic of China. You have the Communist Party in China, but there was an ideological split between the then Soviet Union and the then uh, China under Mao Zedong, and a number of communist parties around the world had this split. Some were loyal to Moscow, and they're the Maoists, the ones who follow Mao were. Uh, followed uh, uh, China. We had, we, we even had it here in Guyana. The present uh, Minister of Home Affairs, his father, Brinley Ben, who was a minister in the PPP government many years ago when Chedi Jagan was premier. Uh, he was in the PPP. And when they had the Sino-Soviet split, he left the PPP and he formed a party called Working People's Vanguard Party Marxist-Leninist. They were Maoists. They used to bring a lot of the Maoist Chinese literature. And they later on became part of when they launched the WPA. That, but it, this is important for you to know as part of the political history of Guyana. So when they had the Sino-Soviet split, President Nixon at the time, he was the president of the United States, and America was courting China, hustling to be friends with China, although China was communist, to stand up against the Soviet Union. They didn't mind that China was communist, but they wanted, they wanted an alliance with China so it could weaken the Soviet Union, although the Chinese were communists. And Kwame Touré used to say that if, if, if communism was a threat to Europe, France had the biggest communist, biggest communist party in Europe. Why you don't invade France? You know? So what I'm telling you is that the, the whole thing about Cuba and Nicaragua, because the article name is not communist, the thing about Cuba has nothing to do with the communist ideology. Because as I pointed out to you, if it was about communism, then explain why America, why is it America will have companies, American companies operating in China, American companies operating in Vietnam, but you won't allow American companies in Cuba. Americans can't even travel directly to Cuba. You have to go through Mexico and take us some other way and then get there. So it has nothing to do with Cuba being communist. It has to do with the Monroe Doctrine that America does not, America, that is how America has always treated the Caribbean. Forget, don't even go, let's, let's leave out Brazil and them now. Those the South American countries that are bigger, they have big economies, more population and all that. America has always treated the United States regime, successive U.S. governments, has always treated Caribbean countries with contempt. With contempt. The Prime Minister Holness from uh, Jamaica and a set of them, they went to see Donald Trump. 
when Trump was president. And Trump had them, Trump had them sitting outside his door. The picture was there. They were sitting outside his door waiting, and he was kind of on a conversation. That's how he was treated. Right? No way Trump could, you could, no way Trump would have been in a position to got Forbes, Burnham, Eric Williams. Errol Barrow or Michael Manley sitting like little boys outside his door before they could come in for meeting. That is how that is how disgraceful and the low level that our leaders have allowed themselves. They they allow themselves to become facto terms of these people of the imperialists. They treat them with disrespect. The the, the Monroe Doctrine. America has never treated the, the independent, our independence with respect. They see us, as I told you, as part of their backyard, that they should influence it. I think it was John Adams, when he was a young man, said we have these burdensome little islands in our backyard who want to sort themselves when they should really be part of us. They want to, they want to colonize you, take you so they can't invade you now and forth, bring you into the union but they will have politicians they will have their people who they will put that will manage the affairs on their behalf i don't know how many of you have ever studied what happened to hawaii how the americans got hawaii the americans invaded hawaii as an independence movement fighting for the, the independence america invaded hawaii put a gun to queen to, to uh, queen uh, luli Kalunina, put a gun to her head and pulled her off the throne. And she signed a treaty. She said to avoid bloodshed and the destruction of her nation and deaths of her people. She signed it. And America took, annexed it, took it at gunpoint and incorporated it into the United States of America. That's, that's history. You're dealing with a bully. You're dealing with a country who has a history of invading. 13 colonies today is 52 states. 13 colonies. They took Mexico, they took Texas. New Mexico was part of Texas, California, all of those. It's called imperial expansion. And that's why whether it's Cornel West or any progressive Noam Chomsky or all of us, we refer to the U.S. as the U.S. empire. It's an empire. It's an empire. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Anyone else? We we have uh, about twenty minutes more. If you're gonna stop at seven o'clock, um, we like to keep these to the, the the time so that you can come again. If we hold another one, I hope my students are understanding that an English course is not about fixing your commas and your verb tenses. Correct. It's correct, about correct, understanding correct. how to use language and how to understand how people can use language to deceive. And Correct. that you are not even to take Mr. Pereira's word for it, but test, yeah. check, research, converse, challenge. You see? Um, you know, there is an old proverb that says, he who fights and runs away will live to fight another day. But I would like to suggest to you that the way the world is going today, there really is nowhere to run. That we have to decide, are we going to be full human beings, fully self-respecting, planning this world for the children to come and so that they can stand up in their full humanity? rather than being bullied and being frightened and being worried about where the next meal is coming from, where the next dollar is coming from. But we will be poor. We will be poor. No matter how much money we have in the bank, if we cannot build a nation that can stand up independently in the world. So that's, I, I don't want to preach. I tend to do that and my students know that about me. Um, okay, Miss Henry is saying 16 of her students attended. Thank you very much, Seneca. Um, I don't know how many. <laughs> Thank of my you, students. and Gerald. Hi, Seneca. Good to see you and hear your voice. Oh, it's lovely to be here and hear your voice. Yeah, thank you. 
Come on, we still have time. I want to hear my students' voices. Can I make a comment? Of course, of course, Stephanie. You can hear me clearly. Oh, sorry, dear brother. Yeah, we're hearing you. Okay, all right. So I must say I'm thankful for this meeting because uh, prior when I heard about this discussion was to be held, I honestly had um, almost half assumed that I would hear the same things I would have heard in the grand meeting I had at my workplace, which is a, a government office. But uh, the different perspectives and the discussion of issues, the link, the, the parallelism, the, the examination of different issues are not things, it's a different kind of discourse. What I would have received before was a perspective, this is the history from this Guyanese perspective alone, but I hear a bunch of different things from all sorts of different countries, all the actions of the different players, and I have a better understanding of the geopolitical situation, not only in Guyana, but maybe the world. So I'm very grateful. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stefan. Brother, I, I just, want to, yes. go I just go want to share something with all of you because it's, it's important for you to uh, know. You know, um, they had the World Conference of the World Conference Against Racism in Durban. It's a big thing in 2001 in Durban, South Africa. And I went it. I represented our organization in, in, in North Africa. And I, I was part of it. So I got there. And um, do you know when the issue of reparations came up? They were discussing reparations. Well, uh, Colin Powell was there. Uh, former U.S. Secretary of State, he was present. And when they were discussing the issue of reparations, a, a man who's a Caribbean diplomat and a lawyer did a lot of work on this reparations issue from the Caribbean side. And when he put forward uh, the arguments, some of the arguments for reparation, you know the U.S. delegation walked out because the U.S., is said plain that they're not going to address this issue of reparation, right? Giving an official apology for slavery and a reparation. And then they had a follow-up meeting in Chile. And when that diplomat was doing the presentation, they, he was actually physically assaulted by U.S. diplomats. He was physically assaulted. I saw the bullyism in South Africa. Now, I want to tell you this. Do you know that when Mandela came out of prison and they had the transition from white rule to black rule, part of the, the arrangement was that when Mandela assumed the presidency, he would hand over the nuclear weapons that South Africa that had already developed, that he would hand it over to the Western countries, to the United States, Britain, and France. In other words, they knew that South Africa, because and the country that provided the nuclear technology, the, the country that transferred the nuclear, the know-how and everything to South Africa to develop the nuclear weapons was the apartheid state of Israel. And that's why South Africa... It wasn't accidental. That is why South Africa led the charge against Israel on Gaza. Because Fidel Castro was there and he addressed the gathering in the stadium. Thousands and people were chanting for Fidel Castro. And you know what Castro said? He said the Cuban troops had to adjust their battlefield tactics because South Africa was prepared to use nuclear, limited nuclear strikes on the Cuban forces and on the African freedom fighters with the full knowledge of the United States, Britain, and France. And when they were defeated and they realized the military option was no longer viable, they entered into talks. And they said, okay, you will have a black government, but you're giving over the nuclear weapons. In other words, it's okay for white government to have nuclear weapons to kill black people. But a black government can't have nuclear weapons. You have to know these things. Right? This is well documented. Because at the time when Mandela was in prison, all the Western countries were supporting the state of apartheid, the apartheid state. In fact, 
Mandela was dodging the South African security for years. And it was the CIA who eavesdropped on him and told the boss, BOSS, the, the Bureau of State Security, the uh, South African intelligence, where Mandela was in. He was traveling in a car, disguised. He put the driver at the back to dress in his suit, and he was driving like he was the, 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 uh, the chauffeur. And the Americans got in and they got dropped and they put a roadblock and arrested. The CIA was able to locate him and got him arrested, and the rest is history. So these are things and you have to know who you're dealing with. Yeah, I also want to stress, though, that there's a big difference between the people inside a nation state and the ruling elite of a nation state. And the, the, the idea That's of right. people's power is what Dr. Mr. Pereira is about. Nicole yeah, Gomes says, Nicole says, sir, can you expound on how America influenced Diana's response to the controversy? She's asking you to kind of reiterate, I think, and it may be useful for you to reiterate that for people like me who need to hear it more States and more. One? How America yeah. influenced Diana's response to the controversy? I guess You're she probably about... means... Nicole, would you... Well, I don't know if it's a male or female. It's NIC. Well, would you want to unmute and speak? Miss, yes. Well, I can hear you. Yes. Say it again, right. Nicole. Miss, well, I came to read to reiterate, read Miss. That's all right. No, well, I think what the the question you were asking is you you want to know how the United States shapes Guyana response to Venezuela. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, what, what the United States does, the, 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 the United States, the US, the US has a history of uh creating the setting um parties against each other. I'll give you an example before I uh get uh show you what is happening. I don't know if you see what's happened what has happened to Imran Khan in Pakistan. Right, Imran Khan was a was a former cricketer who became a politician, but he was one of those educated cricketers. He had many cricketers. He went to London School of Economics and Politics. So he did what is called PEP. PEP is very popular, known at the LSE. It's called Politics, Economics, and Philosophy. So he got involved in political activities and so, and nobody paid attention to him. But he became so popular in the message he was putting out. And Imran Khan won elections. He became he won the elections. He defeated the major parties. And uh, of course, he came to off into office. And we know there's a difference between you can be in office and you don't have power. Office and power are not the same thing. We, we, we learned that political sociology and politics. That a person you can be in office and don't have power. You know, they're two different things. So Imran Khan decided to make certain moves because he had to transform the, Venice, uh, the Pakistani economy. He went to China and he spoke to a gathering at one of the most prestigious and top universities now in the world. The Chinese universities are overtaken. That is the University of Beijing. And he said, we are here to learn from the Chinese. What is it you are doing that is successful? He went back and because he started to move against look, some of the multinational corporations and others, the U.S. conspired with the Pakistani military to concoct a whole set of lies and things against him and remove him because they know that he's popular. They jailed him. And now when he was going to run in the elections, they know that he will win. They trump up other charges and put him away, right? Because you want to know the connection now between the Pakistani military and the U.S. You heard of Al-Qaeda. You heard of Al-Qaeda and you heard of the Taliban. Well, for years, for years, the United States, when you had the former Soviet Union, the Russians was forced to go into Afghanistan, right? Because they, they didn't want that type of so-called Islamic insurgency on the doorstep. So they went in because you had many Soviet republics that had a lot of Muslims. 
And the Americans were working with the Pakistani intelligence to recruit all of these fighters. It was, a, it was the CIA and the Pakistani intelligence that worked with Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda and trained the Taliban to fight the Russians. So after the Russians pulled out of Afghanistan, good, and the Taliban took power, many of these fighters who went to fight for the Taliban, good, left and went back to their countries. They called them the returnees in the Arab countries, and they went back to their countries and started destabilizing them. They started, they did it, and one group split from Al-Qaeda and it became known as ISIS or ISIL, the Islamic State in the Levant, covering Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. And it is the same people who are now creating the same havoc in Mali, in, in uh, Niger, in Burkina Faso, and as far down as Mombasa in Kenya and in Somalia, as well as in Mozambique. So it, it, it's like a germ, a disease that has spread. And all of this started with the Central Intelligence Agency. So they, they wanted that. That was the weakened Russia in Afghanistan. And today, the, 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 that was when it was the Soviet Union. And today they're doing the same through Ukraine to weaken Russia. Good. So they're, what they're doing in Guyana is feeding the Guyana government a whole lot of lies that the Venezuelans want to invade. And Maduro has made it plain. The Venezuelans are saying, the Venezuelans say we have never been aggressors and we have no intention of invading Guyana. Good. Now, they're telling you that they're not have, they don't want to put a military base. They're doubting it. Believe me. Don't believe them. I will not. Two, two persons have come out openly calling for military base in this country. Clement Rui from the PPP and Ravi Dev. Good. Once I have the breath of life that my creator gave me, I am going to do and struggle to make sure no military base is put in this country. My ancestors did not fight for emancipation, right? The Indian indentured servants, the more martyrs and all of those people who were the victims of British colonialism, the British police shot them down, did not give their life. The Amor Am Am Amerindian brothers and sisters who were the victims of colonial genocide did not give their lives in the fight for freedom so that we can have a military base in this country. Guyana, the Caribbean must remain a zone of peace. Once we put a military base in this country, you cannot get them out. A U.S. soldier can shoot you and our laws, he cannot be touched. We have seen it happen in Pakistan and Pakistan is a powerful country militarily. We will become a satellite and that is not what we fought for. And when we have two politicians arguing for that, then we it shows our mental the degeneracy. And I, I ran into Rohi and I told him what I think and I give him a good la tongue lashing with very strong language because I'm that type. I'm not into gentleman gym politics. I believe what Cabral said, the great African revolutionary. Tell no lies, claim no e easy victories. Be straight with the people. That's my, I live by that principle. I do not believe in political expedience and power for the sake of power. I believe that power truly resides with the people and I believe you should be honest with the people. And that's why we said, we always said, we rather get a hundred votes than to get a thousand votes by lying to the people. We're not into the business of politics. So they keep feeding the Guyana government a whole heap of lies and they will buy into it that Maduro is going to invade you. And they're falling fit so they can spend weapons. And I'll tell you something. Many years ago, I got to wink of this thing about the military base. I heard about this military base since in 2004. I met an engineer from an African country. When he learned that I was from Guyana, 
he said, you know, I, I'm supposed to be in Guyana soon. So I said, really? So I thought he was speaking maybe about French something. He said, no, 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 Georgetown. He said, because our company is awarded a contract. We're looking at building a military base. And then the next day, I tried to follow him up, but he 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 realized after he realized I was an activist, and so he he didn't want to have any further discussion with me. And the Morning Star newspaper in Britain carried this thing about a military base. The Morning Star picked it up. A Morning Star reporter, which is a daily, asked the British Foreign Minister that y'all have plans. We have information that y'all have plans to put a military base in Guyana, and he said, "No, not really." And I wrote about it, and the Morning Star carried my interview. I this military based nonsense been around a long time. So now they're going to deny it. They're telling you that they all have plans a military base, but do not be surprised. Mark my words. These cowards on both sides of the political divide will allow them to put down a military base in this country. One senior former senior diplomat, a, a retired diplomat, was telling me that he spoke to the leader of the opposition and told him that he cannot allow that to happen. That he must take a solid. If they're coming for a military base, you can't sit down a military base because once they put it here, they're not going to come out. At Superior, we have exactly five more minutes. Um, I'd like to butt in to say that. I think this is what education is about. You know, I'm asked right. to teach in what we call academic literacies. And we're asked to um, grade your papers based on how much you did not cheat by looking and downloading stuff from chat GPT. Mm -hmm. And we spend hours trying to make sure you're not cheating. Um, and to my mind, that is a waste of time and it is a waste of taxpayers' money to pay university lecturers' salaries to police students. I understand my work as educating students. I do not ask you to believe a single thing Mr. Pereira said here this evening. I ask you to listen, to weigh it against your own feelings, your own knowledge, continue to question, and I know he is available if you want to pick up the conversation again. Anytime. I know we cannot possibly exhaust this subject in one conversation. So I really thank you all for being here. It's a good many of you in here, 45 persons. And um, I see two messages in the chat. Abigail Caesar says, I haven't been so attentive for two hours in a long time. Very interesting and informative discussion. Abigail, Thank if it's ever a true word said, that was it. And the, the recording will be available to you to, for you to listen yeah. again and pick up details that you would have missed. Charlene, I just want to say something to you and the students. I thank you for the work you're doing at UG. And um, it's 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 really amazing what you're doing. I just want to share something with, with you and the students from a former student at UG who completed a conjoint degree abroad in, in both law, did a BA in law, uh, social, sociology and communication and LLB in law. They went, they attended their... Um, University of Auckland, which is, according to you know the Westerns, a, a, a very prestigious university. It's it's rated as their ranking is some way eight in the top one hundred in the world. And she said to me that Auckland University, all the lecturers, most ninety five percent of the lecturers in law, in the economics department. In sociology, especially in sociology, she said you can, all of them, the professors who have double doctorates or what, you cannot find one lecturer or professor in the sociology department or law who, or even in the economics, who believe in trickle-down economics. She was saying that they're radicals who are not radicals are Marxists. And she was saying 
that this is meant to be a white university, but yet she found UG was far more white than the University of Auckland. I think Charlene is aware of this, and Charlene is one who have been resisting it. What she meant is that the curriculum, the, the way the program is structured at UG, and a lot, we have to indulge in some level of criticism because I'm concerned about this young generation, and I'm happy anytime you can contact me through Charlene, I am happy to make books available to you, help you with anything. My area is the social sciences. I don't know anything about chemistry and physics and biology and those things. Don't come to me with that. But anything in philosophy, international relations, sociology, social work, and you need help, you come to me. I will help you with that. I'm here for that. I believe in that and helping the students. But I think, Charlene, you need to point them to some of those books that we have lying in, li in that library that was ordered when you bought when you bought those books because those books will open up their eyes and i'm really i want to say this and i don't mean in any way i don't want it to be recorded the people say Pereira said it but i want to be radically honest charlene you put a lot of energy and i know there are others who try but i have seen students with handouts getting handouts from lecturers and those handouts been there since ug since ug was started that's not good enough. That's not good enough. You know, yes. we have to be used. Yeah. Yeah. And we yes, have to, we have to, mm -hmm. we have to get a more decolonized, decolonized way of doing the things at UG. We need a more radical, radical approach to the social sciences in, in, in UG and other things at UG. Yeah. Yeah. I remember a student in Jamaica. I would try to bring some level of consciousness to my my fifth form students in Jamaica when I thought, Stefan, I yeah. see your hand. And one day I ran into a student who had graduated from school in Jamaica, gone to college and returned. I ran into him on the street corner and he said to me, Miss, you know, all them things you used to tell me of your farm, I no understand. Hmm. I don't want you to wait. Until you graduate, I want you to start understanding your responsibility to interrogate things that make you deeply uncomfortable. If your spirit, your spirit telling you something in right, believe right. your spirit something yeah. in right. Stefan, Correct. go ahead. Let me suggest, uh, I think, uh, listen what Sir said about books to be read. I think uh, if there can be a Moodle post about like five top recommended books that may be available in the library or on Amazon for purchase that students should read to become enlightened about particular issues. I think that would help. I mean, I spend most of my time engrossed in a wall of numbers and reading about scientific topics. So uh, when I would get the chance, then I would refer to this list of recommended readings and uh, come out of my world of numbers for a bit i think that would be helpful like a moodle poster yeah when you say the world of numbers you're doing maths i i'm a data analyst and i'm doing a math degree yeah nothing is wrong with that that's interesting that you mentioned that because one of the things is you know there's this tendency to believe that if you're doing a something like it right or you're doing a medicine or agriculture you don't you don't go read you don't study philosophy you don't study politics or those things that that's a myth Chedi, Chedi Jagan was a dentist, you know, and go and read, go and read the books he have written. You'll believe he was a social scientist. Amilcar Cabral, one of the greatest African revolutionary thinkers who wrote a lot on Marxist, analytical Marxism and philosophy and all of that. He was by profession and training an agronomist, you know? So this, there is this myth that you have to be trained in the social sciences to read philosophy and so on. That's not true. So you you can be an IT man and you could go and read uh, you can read Plato Republic or you can go and read Che Canto the Up the destruction uh, or uh, Chancellor Williams book the, the, the destruction of black civilization or Walter Rodney how Europe on the develop Africa everything is in, interconnected you're an IT person you will be dealing with uh, some of the things you would be handling, the, 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 
the technology that you would be handling, the components that go into this technology and so whether it's computers, uh, cell phones or what have you, they're coming from, from the Democratic Republic of Congo where multinational corporations are raping it. Children are dying to extract the coltan. People are dying, blood, you know, thousands dying every day. It's a genocide down there. And they, 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 they are, so, you, you know, you can't be, there's nothing like a political because the, the, the technology you're operating with, there's blood in it. There's blood in it. Children are losing their lives to just unearth that coltan that goes into cell phone and other components that goes into uh, uh, IT equipment, information uh, technology equipment. Yeah. So it's important for you to have that understanding of perspective. You, there's no such thing as you can't be apolitical and you don't have to be, a, so be in the social sciences to read social sciences. May I invite someone to give a brief vote of thanks, even if it's someone who spoke already? I know I didn't get a chance to meet you in advance. Don't let me down now. Yeah. Could you please repeat this, Wilkinson? Please give the vote of thanks to our guest speaker, Aruni. Your voice is just as good as anybody else. Just give a brief vote of thanks to our guest tonight. Okay. Thanks. All right, I'd love to. Mr. Gerald Pereira, we thank you from not only the lecturers, but everyone Bye. in this class, the students who were able to sit through and listen to all that you had to say. It was a wonderful impartation. And I'd like to say that I, for one, learned a lot from what you discussed. So I'd like to say thank you for your time. Thank you for all the knowledge and information you have shared. And I'm 100% sure that it will not go to waste and it will not have fallen on deaf ears. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I, as I said, I'm always here. Anytime you need help, you can reach out to me through Charlene. And I just want to end by saying uh, what Walter Rodney pointed out many moons ago. He said, history is like a relay race. That the baton is passed on. The ancestors pass it on to us. And I'm doing my best to pass it on because I, I, I'm getting old. I'm not a youngster <laughs> like Charlene. And I want to see this young generation just run forward with it. We owe it to those who have gone before us and to those who are yet to come. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. And speaking for all of us at UG, thank you so much, Mr. Pereira. Students, have a wonderful evening. See you in class. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye.